Good evening. This is Crime Classics. I am Thomas Highland. Listen. The man you hear breathing is named Thomas Edwin Bartlett. He is in bed and sleeping, breathing deep the night air of Pimlico, England. Mr. Bartlett is a heavy sleeper, a deep breather, too, rhythmical and serene, an almost lullaby quality for young Mrs. Adelaide Bartlett, his wife, who this night sleeps at the foot of his bed. Rhythmical, serene. And just at the stroke of midnight, just when a new year has begun, Mr. Bartlett stops breathing. Mr. Bartlett has just died from having drunk too much chloroform, of all things. His wife wakens, sees it is a new year, and celebrates. <coughs> Tonight, my report to you on the shockingly peaceful passing of Thomas Edwin Bartlett, Greenbrook. Crime classic. A new series of true crime stories taken from the records and newspapers of every land from every time. Your host each week, Mr. Thomas Hyland, connoisseur of crime, student of violence, and teller of murder. Now, once again, Thomas Hyland. <laughs> Mr. Bartlett die, it was New Year's Eve in the year 1885. Some years before this, one springtime, when Mr. Bartlett was breathing 100% perfect, he had responded to the delicate scent of a young French girl, and the aroma went right to his heart. He was suddenly in love with Adelaide Blanche de la Tremoise, age 16. Adelaide! Adelaide! Stop skipping rope. I'm talking to you. You made me miss Zoot. You shouldn't say Zoot, my dear. It's an immodest expression. Zoot, 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 Zoot. I'm sorry I made you miss. I apologize. I accept. And now will you do something for me? Anything. Of this, you are sure? Anything, I swear it. Bon, take this rope and tie an end of it to the tree and hold the other end and turn it, and I will jump. Don't you ever get enough of the sport? Look, tie the rope. Very well. Adelaide. Oui? Do you like me? Oh, very much. However... What? You puzzle me. Intrigue you, you mean? I'm glad. Puzzle me. Why you put this sign, gone to fish, on your grocery store this last two weeks, when it is not so? You are here every afternoon in my yard when I come home from school. I have permission from your brother. Editate. You have finished tying the uh, rope? Yes. Uh, you will play. Turn it. Uh, faster! Uh, faster! Faster! Uh, <laughs> oh, oh, my dear... Adelaide, are you hurt? Here, I lift oh, you. Yes, yes, help me. I'm so tangled in the rope. <laughs> Adelaide. Oh, you are very nice. Adelaide, listen. I like your beard, a black beard. Bardenois, Bardenois, Bardenois. Oh, Adelaide, my dear, will you marry me? Marry you? Yes. But I am still in school. Marry me, and it will be the same. You still go to school. And you will help me with my lessons. Every night. And you'll play games with me and jump rope with me. I want to. I will turn and you will jump. Now. Now? Now. All right. Uh, Adelaide. Oui? Will you marry me? But of course, Monsieur Darnois. Adelaide. Oui? Uh, turn the rope faster. Passion in 
Pimlico. Participants, Thomas Edwin Bartlett and Adelaide Blanche de la Tremoise. And the good quality skipping rope, which latter, it might be mentioned, came from the shelves of Mr. Bartlett's grocery store, and which, coiled neatly, was his first gift to her. It was a springtime romance and an honorable one. They got married. And according to Mr. Bartlett's word, the marriage progressed to each one's satisfaction. Mr. Bartlett continued at the grocery store, and Adelaide was still a student. It is a matter of record that she was a good student in the subjects of geography, history, and botany. But it is also a matter of record that one day she brought home with her a note from her teacher. Dear Mr. Bartlett, here is your wife's last examination paper in algebra. As you see, the grade is 43. Her square roots are especially weak, as are her solving equations with two unknowns. Something must be done, else your spouse will not pass into the next form. Sincerely, Edgar Becker, Esquire. P.S. I will be glad to tutor your spouse after school hours. Sign E.B. Esquire. Oh, Adelaide, why are you crying? I am not a good wife. You are wrong, my dear. I am not a good husband. I should have been helping you with your algebra. But you help me so much with my lessons. And you get tired and you go to your room and sleep. Oh, husband. Yes? I do not wish it anymore. I do not wish school. I want your school and Mr. Becker to be proud of you. No. My dear, what's the matter? I do not wish to be a schoolgirl wife, but a woman wife, a mother wife. You're so young. Listen to me. A grade of 43 is nothing to fret over. Why, my cousin Sybil from Nottingham received 23 on her... Listen to me. No, child. You listen to me. I've failed you. I've made you ashamed of yourself. And now I'll make amends. How? I will find you a tutor. A tutor? Oh, not Mr. Becker. A husband. Yes, child. Whatever you say. Trouble in Pimlico. Simply this. The girl wanted to grow up, and her husband wouldn't let her. He told her she'd grow up soon enough, but right now she should play and run and scamper. This period in the married life of Thomas and Adelaide was marked by two events. The first, his presenting her upon her birthday with a game of the mind, domino, hand cards, imported from Persia. The second, a tutor, a veritable quiz in algebra, imported from Bristol. A young man of 21, accomplished in the three R's and other branches of learning. He doted on chemistry, for instance, and one report has it that he was forever indulging himself with practical jokes at the school with chloroform. They say his headmaster constantly fell asleep while admonishing him. His name? George Dyson, Adelaide, your tutor. This is my wife, Adelaide. At your service. Here is your book. Open it to page one. A minus one equals zero. Therefore, A equals 1. Do you understand that? No. Sit by me. I'll teach you. I'll leave you two alone. Now. Mr. Dyson. Yes? You are very young. You are very pretty. You told me. Since the minus quality of one changes to a positive quality as you transpose the integer to the right side of the equation mark, it is obvious then if x minus one equals zero, then x is equal to one. Quite obvious indeed. You are a very good tutor. Did your husband tell you I was to live here? Yes, yes, he did. If x minus two is equal to zero, what does x equal? Two. I'm proud of you. (laughs) 
examination time came around, and Adelaide was at the head of her class. A squared plus B squared is equal to C squared. In the next form she shown, algebra was her strongest subject. One day, Mr. Becker was astounded when Adelaide stood right up in class and said, The cube root of A cube minus 3A square B plus 3AB square minus B cube is A minus B. Then came geometry. George was also a whiz at this. More so. George, share to talk. <laughs> Stop that. Pay attention to your lesson. George, please. Please what? Please kiss me. First, the theorem. Two triangles are congruent when the two sides and the included angle are coincident. Please kiss me. All right. How do I earn my next kiss? in Pimlico. On to trigonometry and the youth. Wife and tutor caught up in the mysteries of logarithms and sines and cotangents and secants. There were field trips, too, to the garden, because George Dyson Tutor believed in practical application of theory. This particular late afternoon, they were endeavoring to determine the height of the flagpole in the garden, using the length and angle of the shadow cast by the pole as points of reference. It was a fine afternoon in the fall. Ah, it was an afternoon to be young. Kiss me. You always ask me to do that, Adelaide. And you always do kiss me. Now, now, suppose your husband should walk out here and see us. Well, he knows about us. You're joking. Or not, he knows. Surely. Oh, do not worry, he's... Oh, kiss me. All right. What a lovely picture. What a lovely, awesome picture. Mr. Bartlett. Of course, kiss her, Mr. Dyson. You deserve it. You both deserve it. Master and pupil. You've done so well together. Go on, Dyson. Sir. Kiss her. Go on. Kiss her. Oh, yes. Bravo, bravo. How's the trigonometry coming, Dyson? Fine, fine. Fine. Well, cook said dinner will be ready soon. I'll call you when it is. Adelaide. What? Don't you find your husband... He is a bore. But I mean, strange. What happened just now? He is a bore, and I despise him. He's your husband. You shouldn't speak like that about him. I'm sorry he's my husband. What would you do if he weren't? You know. I know. But I want you to tell me. The things we talked about... If he wants my husband. I want to tell you something about me you didn't know, Adelaide. Oh, please do. I was quite a chemistry student, too. I could teach chemistry if I wanted to. That is very interesting. Chloroform, for instance, is a chemical. Chloroform? I've heard of it. It belongs to the class of neurotic chemicals which act on the brain and produce loss of sensation. Can it cause death? You carelessly used, it can cause death. Then it is a poison. Let's stroll in the garden. I want to. Chloroform is a colorless, heavy, and volatile liquid, having a, a peculiar ethereal odor which cannot be seen. And they spoke of many things. Husbands, autumn roses, cabbages, kings, and chloroform. Which is a very deadly poison.
Pimlico, England, is noted in a small way for the color of its sunset, a quality which some malcontents have attributed to the quality of the dust in the Pimlico air. However, it's well known that the major divertisement among Pimlicans is walking into the local sunset and making plans. So, as not to defy custom, so walked Adelaide and her tutor, George. You're very dear to me, Adelaide. Oh, please, I know. But it is not the time to speak of it. We were speaking of other things. I used to have fun with chloroform when I went to school. Is it difficult to obtain? In large quantities, it is. However... However what? It can be obtained. But there's a difficulty. Oh? It has a peculiar odor. It's easily detectable. It's almost impossible to get someone to drink it. Unless someone wanted to drink it. Who would want to? Some people, I suppose. Those. Adelaide. Yes, George. I've noticed something. Not your husband. He looks poorly. He suffers. Sometimes at night he comes to my bedroom and tells me how much he suffers. From what? He's bilious. Oh, poor man. He complains of his stomach. I thought they had never seen it. And nervous depression. At night, sometimes he sits in my room, depressed. His stomach. And the doctors have told him that. Has he tried mercury? Mercury? Much easier to obtain than chloroform. I could stop at the apothecary's after dinner. Do stop. His stomach is much worse after dinner. I'm hungry. Let us to dinner, Adelaide. Oh, give me your arm, dear George. The maid servant was just setting the suckling pig on the table when the young folk entered. Mr. Bartlett greeted them with a wave of his fork, and they sat. The dinner was a success, and as usual, Mr. Bartlett exhibited his clean plate for the applause of his wife and her tutor. Over fruit and cheese, George Dyson begged to be excused. I'll be back in a shake, Mr. Bartlett, with a surprise for you. Slice another melon for me, dear Adelaide. And in half an hour, George returned, which was good time for the course, the house to the apothecary and back. But George was in a hurry. And when he returned, Adelaide was waiting for him in the great hall. Quickly, come. What's the matter? After dinner, he almost fainted. He managed to get into the library where he's lying down. His stomach? In the middle of a melon slice. Oh, Mr. Bartlett. Mr. Bartlett, here, I have something for you. What? What is it? Uh, here, now. Let me help you sit up. Uh, Adelaide, that wine glass. Yes. I have something for you, Mr. Bartlett. Something that will make you feel better. Uh, what is it? The surprise I promised you. To make your stomach feel much better. George was very good in chemistry at school. You're a good fellow, George. Drink it. Uh, Hot stuff. Uh, Here, I can't drink any more. Well, I'll leave it here beside you. Sip it when you can. You'll see that when you develop a taste for it, it will be very beneficial. Uh, You're a good fellow. Adelaide, uh... Mm -hmm. Don't worry about me. You have your things to do. Yes, George and I have our lessons. I wouldn't interrupt them for the world. Go, George. Adelaide. We'll look in on you later, Mr. Bartlett. In an hour. Good fellow. Good, good fellow. Mr. Bartlett's stomach quieted after a while. And lying there, he had a thought that perhaps it was George's surprise that did it. So he forced himself to sip again of the glass. However, in time, Mr. Bartlett did develop a taste for mercury and made it a habit to indulge in a sip after every meal. Somehow, his stomach responded suitably, and his complaints were not nearly so many. Of course, it should be noted that Mr. Bartlett would reel suddenly and fall down at odd times. And then he was constantly bumping into things, and his teeth dropped out. Some of his more observant friends would mutter among themselves about Mr. Bartlett's slightly bluish complexion. 
One morning, Mr. Bartlett woke up completely beardless. And from that day on, he never had to shave. But since generally his stomach felt much better, Mr. Bartlett deemed himself ahead of the game. A philosophy which caused comment. Adelaide, the joke. My husband seems happier. Yes, I've noticed. My stomach has improved. Because he doesn't eat so much. Because he lacks sufficient teeth. Your husband has developed a tolerance for mercury. Yes. Mr. Dyson. Mr. Dyson? You mean George? When will you be finished tutoring me, Mr. Dyson? What do you mean? Tomorrow, I should think, Mr. Dyson. What? Tomorrow is the eve of the new year. My husband has asked me to join him in private celebration in his room. We shall drink to your leaving us. But you, you and I... But there's one last favor you can do for me. Well, I'd I do anything. While you're at the apothecary. Apothecary? While you're there. While you're making the purchase of chloroform. Bring me one sachet of lavender, a dozen cinnamon sticks, and a dozen licorice twisties for my husband. Well, then... Then you are giving me one more chance, Adelaide. Mr. Dyson, happy is the day when I shall call you Georges again. <sighs> Lavender, cinnamon sticks, chloroform, and licorice twisted. Two dozen twisties, Mr. Dyson. Good night. It's 11 o'clock, Adelaide. One hour until the new year and our anniversary. Six years. Thomas. Yes, my dear. You remember how you used to come and watch me jump rope? I had a beard then. And I called you Bartois. A drink. Six years, Thomas. We have been married. A drink. I have had enough drink. You, you finish the bottle. I want you to look at me, husband. Very well. Uh, 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 yes. When we were married, I was 16, a child, six years ago. Oh, Adelaide, Adelaide, Adelaide. You see, husband? No longer a child. I drink to you, a woman. Adelaide. What is it? Have you drunk from this bottle? Yes, I think so. It has a pungency to it, doesn't it? Uh, 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 let me say. Uh, Since the 1871. Must have been a strange vintage. Ah, a decided pungency. An aroma, too. Uh, smell it. Mmm, my, good. <laughs> what is it? Uh, Lovely. Oh, it tassels from your nightcap. It tickles. Oh, does it? Drink <laughs> makes you so attractive, dear Thomas. Makes me attractive, huh? Eh? Tell Cook to order a bag of lump. Oh, later. Finish the bottle, dear. And then I have something to tell you. All right. Now. What is it you have to tell me? Oh, you confess it now, do you not, that I am a woman, an attractive woman, yes, Uh, and finally a wife, my husband. uh, Six years now, and you have observed me only as a child and a treating me. Adelaide, 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 Adelaide. On further passage between them on this, their sixth New Year's Eve together, and their wedding anniversary... On further passage, history is obscure. It is known, however, that they were alone in the house, except for their servants. It is known, too, that five bottles of champagne were consumed. Two bottles Chantilly 1871, a pungent vintage. According to the record, it has been said that a few moments before the new year was ushered in, Mr. and Mrs. Bartlett were both asleep. He stretched across the width of the bed. She at his feet. And once more, I refer you to Mr. Bartlett, asleep. Rhythmically. Serene. Thomas. Oh, 
Thomas. Thomas. Mr. Bartlett was dead. That didn't do any good. It was another year, but not for Mr. Bartlett. For Mr. Bartlett, a post-mortem examination. For his stomach, evidence of having contained a considerable amount of chloroform. So there was a coroner's inquiry. And there was a verdict of willful murder against Adelaide Bartlett and George Dyson. At the trial, each made a statement protesting their innocence. Yes, it is true that I purchased chloroform at various apothecaries. And it is true that the total amount I purchased thereby was sufficient to cause death. However, I use the chemical merely to clean spots from my clothing. I have many pieces of clothing and believe neatness is next to righteousness. It is true also that I became attached to Mrs. Bassett, but only because she was well-versed in matters mathematical. It was a constant source of joy to me to be able to sit and speak with her of an evening of theorems and theories and postulates and corollaries. I loved my husband. He encouraged me to pursue studies of various kinds and decided to please him. On the night of his death, my husband was in good spirits and drank heavily. He, I must confess, was never more attractive. But he fell asleep, a deep sleep. From this he never awakened. I never know why. Nor does anyone else know why. The jury debated for two hours and returned a verdict of not guilty. History at this point again becomes obscure. It is not known whether George or Adelaide ever saw each other again, whether they ever again tasted together the dusty fruits of a Pimlico sunset, whether there were any more math lessons or talks of matters chemical. But it may be safe to assume that some of the dust breathed by the Pimlicans on evening walks. Some of it has been contributed by George and Adelaide and Mr. Bartlett. You might be interested in knowing where once stood Mr. Bartlett's grocery store, now stands an apothecary. This is all the information I have. Thank you. Good night. Thomas Edwin Bartlett, tonight's crime classic, was adapted from the original court reports and newspaper accounts by Morton Fine and David Friedkin. The music was composed and conducted by Bernard Herman, and the program is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis. Thomas Highland is portrayed on radio by Lou Merrill. Thomas Edwin Bartlett was played by Herb Butterfield, Adelaide by Betty Harford, and George by Terry Kilburn. Bob Lamont speaking. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.